Okay, so Graham uh, was the developer of Zia 2. So Graham really uh, sort of pushed forward into the sort of automated uh, X-ray crystallography data processing realm. And I think it wasn't necessarily the first package. I don't know if anyone ever used ELVs or some of the sort of early treatments, but I think it was one of the first that had some solid sort of decision making, made some intelligent, some sophisticated choices could be made for along the data processing path. And that gets uh, more and more sophisticated with, with uh, recent versions. And uh, this goes beyond the uh, sort of necessity of repeating the sort of tedious and repetitive tasks. But as detectors get faster, as people collect data remotely, uh, automated routines to process data are going from you know, convenient to, to critical. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Graham. Graham, are you there? Yes, thank you, I am. Yep. Can you hear me? Go right ahead. Okay, thank you. So thank you for the invite to do the webinar today. Uh, I've got this first slide up here as requested. So is everything okay? Yep, looks good, sounds good. Go right ahead. All right, let's crack on. Good, okay, so um, I'm here today to talk about Dials, which is a new integration program we're working on here. I was going to start by introducing the Dials project some and then wade straight into doing a demonstration of the software. After that, I'm going to talk a bit about the algorithms inside Dials and some of the applications. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of Dials, but the uh, software is actually written as a collaboration principally between Diamond, LightSource, uh, Nick Sorter's team at Berkeley Lab and the CCP4 group. And like every other project in the world, we need funding. And so we get uh, funding from those institutions and also the NIH and the European Union. Um, so as I've sort of mentioned here, uh, Dials East is based on the Harwell campus here in uh, Oxfordshire in the UK. And we're focusing on synchrotron rotation data. And Nick Sorter's team are also working on Dials over in uh, Berkeley Lab there. But they're principally focusing on XFEL data. At the two sites, we've got pretty reasonably sized development teams. So I won't go through the names now, but if you contact the help desk and anything like that, these are the people who will be answering your questions. Okay, so one thing I always like to do when talking about dials is to actually acknowledge the scientific context in which dials has been developed. Because um, unlike many areas of science, the actual algorithms behind crystallography are very well published. So, um, you know, people like Wolfgang Kabsch, Andrew Leslie, and Jim Flugraff, and also the people who contributed to the Lua workshop back in the 80s, all spent a lot of time carefully writing down the way the algorithms work so that somebody coming along in, to pick a random date, the mid 2010s, can write an integration program starting from there. And without these resources, we would have found it very hard to do what we've done. So, thank you to all these people. Okay, so. I'm principally going to talk about dials for synchrotron radiation today. I believe Nick Sort has already done one of these on dials for XFEL. Um, and I thought it's important to start with the expectations. So the dials integration program logically fits the same ecological niche as, for example, MOSFILM, in the sense that it's got all of the tools required to uh, analyze, index, integrate, the uh, X-ray diffraction images, but it doesn't include the uh, scaling and intensity analysis. So in exactly the same way as it's done for MOSFILM, we use pointless and aimless by default for doing the scaling. However, the integration algorithms and so forth are very similar to XDS, and I'll come on to those a bit later. One important point is at this stage, Dials does not include a GUI. So there's stuff in development, but at the moment, it's very much focused on the command line. Um, one thing it does have is an awful lot of very powerful visual analysis tools that I'll try and demonstrate later on. OK, so if you're using dials, to be perfectly honest, the way we recommend to use dials is simply to type zia2 minus dials and use the sort of standard zia2 command line and then let that do the work. And the hope is that that would do as good a job as somebody running dials interactively. Um, I have to be honest, this is the way we use dials here uh, because it's very straightforward. It does all the scaling for you and normally it works fine. 
However, there would be absolutely nothing for me to talk about focusing on you type this and then you go away and let the computer do the work. So I'm today going to focus on how to use dials through the command line and step you through the tools that are available and some of the interesting stuff that you can do with it. Okay, now I kind of warned you already that dials is a command line program. And in fact, I lied. It's several command line programs, dozens of them in fact, but there's about six or eight that you really need to use. And the workflow is kind of illustrated on the left here. And actually you can just follow the arrows straight from the top to the bottom down here. And sorry, can you see my mouse? Do you see my mouse pointer? Yep, okay. Um, you can follow it straight. So from importing the images, which, oops, reads the image headers and constructs a model of the experiment. Uh, so in exactly the same way as you would with other programs, you first find spots and images and index. Um, at this stage, you've got some choices that I'll come to when I do the uh, demonstration. And then we just integrate, the, refine the data, integrate it, and export data to MTZ format. So essentially what's happening is we pass some images in and this, these are read with something called the diffraction experiment toolbox. And from them, we extract a model of your experiment. So the beam line, the goniometer, the detector, and the scan. And then the uh, spot finding and indexing gives us a model of the crystal. All of this is passed through to refinement, which gives basically just refined models that we use for integration. So the flow here is generally very straightforward but it does have some uh, useful opportunities for doing more powerful stuff. For example, the um, results of integration could in principle be used to rerun another cycle of refinement with better estimates of the centroids. Equally, you can, there's no coupling between the algorithms used for refinement and the algorithms used for integration. So you can use um, any algorithm you like for doing the uh, refinement of the experimental models and you could, example, for example, have 2D integration or 3D integration or ray tracing or any of these things using those models. So because of this, the, um, anything to do with the reflection profiles is explicitly separated from models relating to the model of the experiment. So this may all sound rather abstract at the moment, but when I run through the tutorial, it should make a lot more sense. OK, so let's run through a demonstration. So. Here we go. Right. So as I said, the first step is to import data. So you can either pass data as a list of files, or you can just pass a directory, or you can pass templates, and so forth. In this case, the easiest example is just to pass a directory full of images. And what's happened here is it's gone through, read all of the images, and it says, I found 360 images. These belong to one logical suite. So that means it's one continuous range of data. If at this case, it said there were 360 sweeps, that may say that there's something going wrong with reading the image headers, or equally if there are 360 stills and so forth. Um, if you've got two scans, so you've taken two data sets, you'll get two sweeps here and however many images. So um, at the moment, we could just look at the images with, so take the image viewer and pass it the data block. So that's the thing that contains all of the models. And we can get the image viewer up. I don't know how clearly you can see this. Um, but this gives you a clear view of the images and you can step through the images here and so forth. Look at the, look and look and see how the data look. So the first thing you usefully want to do is to uh, find spots on the images. Now, by default, within dials, we actually treat the entire data set for all of the spot finding and indexing steps. And I'll explain reasons for this as we go through the processing. But basically, what it does mean is we can get a, a complete model of the diffraction uh, all the way from the beginning of the scan to the end of the scan without having to refine as we go. So here we've got all of the uh, reflections. So the, the spot findings found 200,000 reflections and written them into a data file called strong.pickle. Um, 
uh, all of the reflection files in dials are written in the uh, Python pickle format. So I can again look at the image viewer, pass it a data block, and I can also pass it the strong file. And then I can actually see the spots that the spot finding has found just to make sure they look sensible. So there we go. And from what I can see here, zooming in, these all look pretty sensible. You've got the bounding box in blue, the red cross marks a centroid, and the pale spot marks the uh, brightest pixel in that spot. So again, these are all in three dimensions. So as you step through, you should be able to see some spots that were partial recorded across multiple images. OK, so um, one of the things you can also do at this stage is actually look at the reciprocal lattice. So this is simply giving you a view of how the spots look in reciprocal space. And this is an incredibly powerful tool for diagnosing problems. So that's the rotation set that I've recorded. And I can actually zoom in and see the, the, the native reciprocal lattice without doing any processing on it. But there's a lot more we can do with that for diagnosis, but for routine processing, that's not necessary. OK, so the first thing I said we probably want to do is index the data. So what's happening here is this is taking all of the strong peaks and the models recorded from the image headers in the data block, transforming those strong peaks to reciprocal space and then um, performing by default a 3D FFT. I could actually have used a 1D FFT algorithm here or the real space grid network method. Um, a lot of background noise happening. Uh, has somebody got their microphone switched on? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and mute all here and then I'll unmute you. Hold on. Okay, that's much better. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so what's happening here is that the um, all of the reciprocal lattice points are being uh, Fourier transformed using the 3D FFT algorithm, which for any of you who are in, interested in historical stuff, was first suggested uh, back in the Lua workshops in the 80s. And I think there's something similar to it in Denso indexing, but that only works for a single image. Here, we're running from a complete data set. So what you'll see is that the indexing first worked to a fairly low resolution. And then, so you index spots to, say, three angstroms or something like that, runs a cycle of refinement, and then indexes all the spot list again to a higher resolution, and then runs a cycle of refinement and so forth. And this macrocycle method means that normally you can bootstrap your way to a very accurate indexing solution very easily. So small errors in the uh, beam center or detector distance and so forth normally don't have a significant effect. So the indexing by default will do everything in P1. And so here we can see the unit cell constants for the uh, primitive lattice and the RMS deviations from the indexing. So here you can see in X and Y, it's around a quarter to a fifth of a pixel, and the Z is about a fifth of an image. So by any reasonable stretch of imagination, that's a pretty reasonable um, indexing solution. Now, obviously, you could go ahead and actually process all of your data in P1 and then worry about uh, sorting out the indexing into the correct lattice at the point of scaling. And actually, that works perfectly well. But often, people like to know early on what the symmetry is. So we actually have a program called dials.refine Brave settings. So what this is doing is taking the results of indexing, which is the experiments, so that's a collection of models that describe the experiment, and the index spot list, and it's going to consider that a maximum symmetry possible for these unit cell constants, and then try re-indexing the data to every symmetry between P1 and that maximum symmetry, and then running the refinement. 
with the re-indexed lattice and with those lattice constraints. And you end up with a table like this. So anyone who's familiar with the output of MOS film should be completely at home here. The metric fit is the number that MOS film calls the penalty. Um, we in dials use the um, lattice determination code that was written in CCTBX for label it. So this is actually using the Lepage delta as a metric penalty. So this number in the second column essentially indicates how much the lattice had to be distorted to meet the constraints of the symmetry. So uh, the third column shows the RMS deviation for the predictions if that lattice symmetry has been applied. And you can see here from the, these two columns that the um, solution number two is much better than any of the solutions further up the pile. So the uh, imp imposing the body-centered monoclinic lattice doesn't make the predictions any worse, but picking two other centers, uh, two other settings of the body-centered monoclinic makes it much worse. The next column along shows you something that we can do in indexing that other packages can't, is because we found spots on a large range of data, in this case, 180 degrees of data, we can actually look at the correlation coefficients of the uh, intensities of the found spots as a function of the symmetry operations implied by the lattice that you can list here. So in this case, you can see that there's an 84% correlation coefficient by applying the uh, symmetry operation from the body-centered monoclinic. But if you take symmetry operations implied further up, the symmetry drops massively. And this is very helpful for pot spotting cases where you have uh, pseudo-tetragonal or pseudo-orthorhombic data sets. And you can spot it at this early stage without having to go through and process the data and then go right back to the beginning again and rerun the indexing. So all of these taken together indicate that the solution number two is correct. So what I now need to do is re-index the data from the primitive setting to the body-centered monoclinic. So the output here conveniently shows it, um, but you can also just uh, get the uh, program to determine that change of basis automatically by passing the orientation matrix from solution number two and the indexed reflection file from the P1, and it will determine the correct re-indexing solution to apply and give you the re-indexed data. And that's really quite quick. So what I can do now is run a quick cycle of refinement to verify that the Brave setting number two, this one here, is actually consistent with the data that's been re-indexed. So Brave setting number two and re-indexed dot pickle. And this will just run exactly the same static refinement as was being performed as part of the um, indexing. And as you can see here, the RMS deviation is actually slightly higher in X and Y, but that's kind of to be expected because we've taken away two degrees of freedom. Now, one of the things that you uh, may suffer from in a rotation data set is the uh, crystal orientation or unit cell changing very slightly as you uh, rotate the crystal. So this may be because your goniometer is wobbling or the crystal slips or radiation damage or simply because you're illuminating different parts of the crystal. And one of the things we've built into dials from the very beginning was the principle of allowing the unit cell and the crystal orientation to vary during integration but to refine that before we begin. So here we've got, uh, if we keep a note on the RMS deviation in X is 0.288. If I allow the uh, unit cell and orientation to vary during the scan now by telling the refinement to um, allow variations during the scan, the refinement will take a little bit longer because we've got uh, very significantly uh, more parameters into the model, but the problem is still massively over-determined because as you can see, 
it's including 133,000 um, observations into the data set, but we've only got maybe 50 or 80 parameters to refine. And now the RMS deviations in X has dropped from 0.288 to 0.226. So that's a quarter of a pixel, which is pretty reasonable by any stretch of the imagination. At this stage, you may want to actually look back at the images and see how the uh, predictions overlap. So we have the opportunity to pass the refined experiments file into a prediction program, and this will simply calculate the, all of the centroids uh, implied by the experimental model. And again, we can look at the image viewer with the refined experiments and the predictions and see how those predictions overlap. So if I zoom in a bit, these little red spots mark the center of the reflections. So any reflections that don't have a red mark on them, the actual center is in an adjacent image. But oops, you can see that they are pretty well lined up with the um, with where the spots are, are to be found. So you wouldn't normally need to do that. You can normally just go straight into the integration, uh, which is performed as follows. So it's passing the uh, refined experiment model and the list of refined um, spots into integration. Here I've allowed the computer to use eight processors for doing the integration to speed things up. So at this stage is the first point where the um, software is actually beginning to consider the reflection profile. So this is using an XDS type integration algorithm. So it's saying that the uh, mosaic spread is about a quarter of a degree and the beam divergence is about uh, a 20th or so of a degree. Um, so that's pretty typical for uh, fairly reasonable synchrotron rotation data. So what's happening here? is the integrations actually performed in two steps. The first step is to build reflection profiles across the detector and throughout the image. So this is taking the uh, parameters that I showed you just now and transforming the density in the index strong spot list to work out how those spots would look in reciprocal space. And then once it's got that model of the uh, strong spots, it will go through and perform integration. And as you can see, it's performed chunk-wise. So we've got the first 36 frames are in the first block, and then frames 18 to 54. So the second block half overlaps the first block, and so on and so forth. And the purpose of this is that we build up reflection profiles within that block. And then you always assign for a given spot, you, you pick up the profile at, uh, from the center of the nearest block. And this means that the vast majority of the reflections are fully recorded and very, very few split across uh, job boundaries. So out of um, how many? Hundreds of thousands, we've got a, a couple of thousand are split across job boundaries. And those are probably too wide to be usefully measured anyway. So now it's going through and actually uh, integrating the data by 3D profile fitting. So the output shows you the fact that on each image, you've got a number of reflections fitted by or estimated by summation integration, another number estimated by profile fitting. So these are fewer than the total number of images, uh, reflections on the image because some of the reflections are within the tile join region. In this case, it's on a, from a Pilatus. Um, Equally, if you've got hot pixels or you've got zingers and so forth, they'll be thrown out as outliers as well as a side effect of this. So normally you have slightly more uh, summation integrated reflections than profile fitted ones. And those two numbers are normally smaller than the total number of reflections available. So we've now integrated the entire data set. You end up with a little summary of the output here. I've actually integrated the corners. So 
the um, high resolution limit is 1.14, but the completeness out there is very low indeed. We get an estimate of the summation and profile fitted I over sigma overall. Uh, clearly, the results you get from scaling will be much more robust than those. We've got a total of 386,000 fully recorded reflections and about 10,000 that were partially recorded. So they're across job boundaries or were incomplete at the beginning or at the end of the scan. Uh, there's a whole load of other summary information written up out here. And to be honest, the best thing to do is when you've got a quiet moment to read through it. There's a lot of interesting information that, for example, Yit Zia2 uses to generate the summary output that you may be familiar with. So at this stage, to a large extent, the work of dials is done. Um, the last stage of our software is to um, export the data as an MTZ file, which is somewhere, here we go. So this just basically takes the uh, integrated reflection data the uh, models used for actually integrating the data, and it just writes out an MTZ file that's perfectly suitable for importing into pointless and scaling using the standard CCP4 route. So um, personally, I prefer to use the symmetry-based uh, settings in pointless. So I'm going to use that here, and that's just going to um, re-index the data uh, as necessary and more importantly, sort it and give me useful uh, analysis results as well. So here you can see that the twofold comes out very clearly indeed, and the individual symmetry operations, the others are definitely not observed in this data set. So the um, output from the Brave uh, settings analysis was uh, reliable here. So that's running pointless and you know clearly you can take more time over scaling your data with pointless and aimless uh, there are very useful tools available in ccp4i for doing this or if you're familiar with script you can do it that way or we normally recommend users to just simply use zia2 which includes all of this as part of the standard analysis so this is just doing its uh, normal stuff. I'm sure Phil Evans would give a much more useful description of what's going on here. But we can see the average unit cell constants written out. So these end up in the MTZ file. And the merging stats here, uh, I've limited the data to 1.4 angstroms, where they're fairly complete. But you can see that if the detector had been a little bit closer in, we could have quite easily got to higher resolution with this crystal. Um, so that's that's the way you uh, can go through using dials. I'm now going to talk a little bit more about some of the underlying algorithms. So I've shown the image viewer a couple of times, and this is actually a very, very powerful tool for seeing how dials works. So the spot finding methods that are used in the uh, dials.findspots algorithm are also available in the image viewer. So this would be the original image for a, a different data set. And there are a number of options available uh, for showing the local mean and the local variance. And then the third one is the, uh, is the uh, dispersion, which is the uh, local variance divided by the local mean. And if you've got an area of background, you would expect the mean to be equal to the variance if you've got your gain right. And if you've got any signal there, that will be very, very brightly highlighted, which is what you see here. So you can see the spots from your data set much more clearly in the dispersion map than you can in the raw data. So then what we do is uh, we find the connected pixels, which gives you this larger number of um, Peaks. So this is all the pixels that are above the threshold. Then we find the centroids of the connected regions that give you this very fine um, image of your diffraction data. So this is what the spot finding actually sees. So if I um, load one of the one of the things that's cropped up 
in recent history is applying this to um, CCD data from a Rigaku Saturn. Um, so, if I pull up the first image in an example data set, so here you can see a perfectly reasonable looking diffraction image. But if I look at the dispersion map and particularly the threshold, you can see that there's a massive amount of tiny, tiny peaks in the map. And this is because this calculation assumes that your detector gain is one. So if you're analyzing data from a CCD, you may need to uh, work on the gain. One option is to use the dials.estimate gain tool, or the other is to fiddle in here until you end up with a number that gives you much more reasonable looking image and then you can pass that into the spot finding. Um, so one thing we found historically is the fact that the spot finding methods are available through the image viewer. It's very easy to tune them to new detectors or to XFELs and so forth. Okay, so the indexing method I sort of introduced already. So we take the reciprocal lattice points that were shown earlier in the reciprocal lattice viewer uh, we Fourier transform these, which gives you a very clean map of the direct space lattice, and then just do uh, peak finding on that and find a basis that describes the three-dimensional shape of that well. And that's exactly what's happened here. I've talked about the solution picking already. In the refinement, uh, one particular choice made, which is distinct from the development choices in MOSFILM, is we allow a completely general experimental geometry. So where, for example, in MOSFILM, it's always been assumed that the detector is perpendicular to the beam and that the rotation axis is parallel to a direction on the detector. Here, we have no assumptions built in at all. So you can have a completely general model of the experiment, which means that there's a far more robust uh, input into the refinement, which gives us these uh, very accurate predictions that I showed earlier. So if you look at the uh, scan varying refinement results, there are tools for doing this, you'll see these kind of small changes in the unit cell parameters over here and in the crystal orientation here. So these are logically very similar to the misorientation parameters that you'd see from something like uh, MOSFILM and XGS writes out similar things as it integrates as well. So these are all very familiar kind of numbers. One other thing that we do as part of dials is actually, instead of treating for, for example, a Pilatus 6M as a single fixed detector, we can actually treat every module on the detector as a separate uh, sensor and then allow those to move with respect to one another during the refinement. And that can, for good data, give quite significant improvements in the RMS deviations. So on the left here, you can see the mechanical structure of the Pilatus detectors and the tiles that are not quite where the instrument model would say they are. Uh, by allowing those to be refined, we can get a much flatter distribution of the residuals. Now you'll see that the actual errors are of order uh, a tenth of a pixel, a tenth of a millimeter, sorry. So they're not particularly substantial. And actually uh, for reasonable data, this doesn't make a big difference. But if your data are very weak, it could be something that has a factor. This analysis has also been proven to be very useful for analyzing XFEL data, where the precise knowledge of the tile positions is poorly known. When it comes to integration, um, if you inspect the code inside dials, you'll find that it actually reflects the structure of the papers I referred to earlier very accurately. So this is uh, an excerpt from uh, Wolfgang Kabsch's description of the algorithm for 3D profile fitting in XDS. And on the right is the code that implements it and it's basically a, a literal translation of the code. So as I said before, uh, 
we take the full scan of data, break it up into chunks that partially overlap. So what this means is if I'm integrating a reflection at, at any point in the scan, there's normally a center, a central reflect, uh, a central a center of the box, whoops, that's uh, close to my current location, where the entire spot can be associated with the center of that box and be entirely contained within that within that block. So there will be a few reflections close to the rotation axis where this isn't true, but for 99.9% .9 of reflections, they will be completely contained within one block. Okay, so if we look at the distribution of I over sigmas on the detector, these are consistent with what you'd expect, that you've got strong data towards the middle of the detector, weaker data towards the edges. Uh, the reflection profiles, the correlation is actually greatest at medium resolution, because at uh, low resolution, the strongest spots you can see structure which is slightly different to the reference profiles, and the weaker data are obviously weak, so you use profile fitting to get a good estimate of those. Um, this is actually rather well known, and part of the reason why we write out both summation integrated and profile fitted data is that the strongest data at the very center of the detector are actually best modeled from the summation integration rather than the profile fitting. And aimless makes up its mind about the correct uh, ratio of intensities to take. For those of you who are uh, veteran MOSFILM users, you'll find in some of the uh, output from the dials integrate step, reflection profile pictures that look very similar to those from MOSFILM because we quite liked that representation. Okay, so I've tried to talk through a bit about the uh, tools that we've put into or we developed within dials. Within their application for Zia 2, what we've done is taken the importing, find spots, indexing, and refine Bravi settings, push them into an indexer. So any of you who are familiar with the terminology of Zia 2, this should be uh, meaningful. Where dials refine is rather lonely in the refiner, and then the integration and export MTZ are the integration step. And then it scales with exactly the same scaling code as we had already had in place for MOSFILM. What this means is that you can run a very normal uh, Zia2 command with minus dials in the place of minus 2D or minus 3D, pass it a directory full of data, get out some meaning, meaningful results from which you can get to electron density maps and do the rest of your work you want to do. Early on in the, the development of dials, this was actually very important because it showed that uh, as the helices turned the right way, it meant that we hadn't at any point inadvertently inverted the orientation matrices, which is apparently a risk that can happen. <clears throat> so one of the um, focuses we've had within dials is actually to try and treat uh, weak diffraction data very well. Uh, so I've got an example data set here from some thermal icing where I used about uh, less than a tenth of a percent of the beam on one of our beam lines to record. So here's a strong spot out at about five angstroms, six angstroms, and you can see it's got about 40 counts in it. If it's it's uh, two full rotations of data giving about 70 fold multiplicity. If I process the data with XDS using autoproc, the I have a sigma curve at the top here looks fairly sensible, but the fourth moment of E plot shows something nasty happening beyond about two angstroms. The same plot from uh, dials using, uh, or Zia2 using dials, gives a very similar looking I over sigma plot, which is perhaps slightly better behaved at high resolution, but a much more reasonable distribution of uh, the fourth moment of E, which is saying that the estimates of the intensities are much closer to belonging to a Wilson distribution. Um, here we've got some different analyses, so you'll see the on the left hand side the uh, CC half and the CC anom are very similar from dials and from XDS, but the cumulative intensity plots on the right are very different. Now, I've got some refinement stats here as well, which show that actually when you're coming to refine the data, by and large, there is very little difference in the intensity, in, in the quality of data between dials and XDS, which is to be expected, although at high resolution, there's an argument that says that the results from dials are slightly more consistent. 
So I have actually, in fairness to Kai Diedrich and uh, Wolfgang Kabsch, the XGS developers, uh, mentioned this to them before uh, mentioning it anywhere in public. And they accept the fact that in this case, there's some work needed within XGS to get the algorithms up to uh, the standard that they would expect from XGS. And one argument I'd make is that this is actually for the general benefit of the community, is having <coughs> excuse me, new tools coming along that show what can be done with X-ray diffraction data gives everybody a push to achieve that. So all of the software will get better thanks to this challenge. Now, you may argue the fact that these data were measured in a rather absurd manner, and there would be a lot to be said for that point of view. However, the new, develop, uh, the new uh, detectors that are coming along are highly optimized for recording exceedingly weak data. And there may become a time where we move towards always recording high multiplicity, very weak data. And so trying to extract the best from this will be uh, a key challenge for any new integration programs. OK, so uh, just going to finish off here with some other examples. So at Diamond, we don't just have MX beam lines. We also support small molecule crystallography. So here we have a photograph of a new end station, I19.1. And you can see here that the experimental geometry may not be entirely consistent with those normally used for diffraction experiments. So we've got a partial chi goniometer and a large Pilatus detector on a two theta arm that allows it actually to go to two theta angles greater than 90 degrees. And in this case, the ability to have a completely general experimental geometry became key. So we've got some, a, a different set of problems when we come to deal with uh, chemical crystallography data. So we have um, more challenging experimental geometry, highly absorbing samples, and higher energies used for routine data collection, which means we have a, a different set of problems to consider. Now, the highly absorbing sample one is actually something that people doing MX with long wavelengths also face. But you can still pipe exactly the same data into Zia2, uh, just tell it it's small molecule data, so it tests all the space groups, not just the ones useful for biological crystallography. And you get the same sort of report come out. And you can take the data forward and solve your small molecules and get fairly reasonable results. OK, so the status of dials is that uh, it's been routinely used at Diamond and elsewhere for a couple of years now. And it will very shortly be in CCP4. It's, as far as we're concerned, Zia2 is the friendly user interface for dials when it comes to processing synchron data. And to that end, actually, the way we distribute Zia2 these days is we bundle it with dials. There are a bunch of tools included uh, with dials for, doing, look, for looking at your data more thoroughly. I haven't had anywhere near enough time to go through them all here. And even so, I've run over time. Um, but there's a lot to play with. And we'd always welcome people getting in touch with the support list if you have any questions. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the development teams uh, here at Diamond and at the uh, LBL. <clears throat> We've also had a significant amount of input from the MOS Film and CCP4 and Gary Mershadov and Phil Evans and so forth. All these guys have put a lot of thought into how dials should work. We've had uh, a lot of input from the global phasing team, particularly uh, feedback and bug reports about how dials uh, performs and a huge amount of input from people who've used dials and given us helpful feedback on it. So general users and diamond scientists. So I'd like to thank all of them. Uh, if you have any questions about dials, please get in touch with the mailing list. So uh, that's detailed on our web page. And with that, I am done. So thank you all for listening. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to send them to me in the chat window. I can pass them on. Um, I'll note uh, that we uh, include dials in the SP Grid programs tree. Uh, we update that with, uh, with a dials monthly or release from a dials nightly. So we test here. It works. Uh, it's always worked well in my hands. But for uh, bugs, feel free to uh, email us, and uh, we can pass those along. Um, so any questions? Yep, here, come around. Come around. We've got uh, a local group here, so I'll have them just come around to the uh, to the microphone. 
Hi, I'm Sean. I'm from Harvard Medical School. So actually, I noticed that in one of your last several slides, you have you just mentioned a, a redundancy data, like comparison between the dial and the XDS, but you didn't, you know, extend it. Uh, talk about a lot that. Uh, do you have any ideas what is the difference for a high redundancy data set compared to the dial and the XDS? So I've discussed this with uh, Kai Diedrich at some length, and I think in essence, it comes down to modeling the reflection background when the background is made up of very small numbers like zero, one, and two. And um, because XDS was developed with, uh, for example, CTD data and so on and so forth, um, there may be assumptions made that were utterly reasonable at the time that have meant that uh, today when we record exceedingly weak data with uh, very weak backgrounds, it becomes slightly harder to model that background accurately. Um, so this is also a problem, been a problem for MOSFILM as well. Um, I know they are working very keenly on trying to resolve uh, these differences. And to be honest, if you measure your data according to the guidelines that are on the XDS wiki, um, then you will not have any problems. But the data here were recorded with an average number of photons per pixel uh, that was massively smaller than one. I think it was something like 250,000 counts per 6 million pixels. So uh, most people would argue that's rather an absurd way to measure your data. But there may come a time in the future where that becomes routine. So that's hopefully helpful. I don't know. I have one question about the um, sort of future, and maybe it's too early to say. Uh, so dials and Zia2 are sort of, you know, collinear projects in some uh, regard. Do you intend that those will stay separate for, uh, you know, stay as sort of separate, or will Zia2 become a part of dials? What do you think? Um, my feeling is that Zia2 is already part of dials. However, it's very much an optional part of dials. And um, we are working with other people developing pipelines for doing x-ray diffraction data processing to help them make use of dials within their pipelines as well. So uh, there's a very high overlap between the dials development team and the Zia2 development team these days, um, in the sense that the Zia2 development team is entirely contained within the dials development team. So, you know, there's a, a large point of view that says that they are, you know, Zia2 is simply now an interface, one, one user interface that you can use to dials. Uh, although, obviously, we continue to support the use of XDS and MOSFILM as well. Okay. Um, but there's, it, it, it's in no sense of the word exclusive. So anybody else developing pipelines is entirely at liberty to include dials in their pipelines. Great. Well, with that, we'll uh, wrap it up. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, that was great. And uh, I'll follow up with you again offline. Great. Thank you very much.